Thank you, Sadhav, for the, the great presentation. And I already see a lot of coffee cups on the table, so I really appreciate your presence. Um, so yeah, I'm Rohit. I'm an applied research scientist at Georgian. And uh, please allow me to take you on a story of a great collaboration between SPINS and Georgian. So SPINS is uh, a startup, well at this point a company, and they have been operating in uh, the retail industry where they work with uh, retailers across North America. And their primary goal is to derive meaningful insights uh, so that they can drive uh, meaningful decisions uh, that can impact their underlying business. And we are Georgian. Uh, it's a venture capital firm. And unlike most VCs, we have an in-house R&D team and we work with our portfolio companies on accelerating their product roadmap. So from helping you hire talent all the way up to building models and putting them to production, we are there for you. So yeah, what's the problem? Uh, so as I mentioned, Spins is working with a bunch of retailers across North America, and they're getting in a lot of data from different retailers, right? And what they're trying to do is they're trying to consolidate all of this data into one industry-leading database using which they can, they can uh, get product insights. But as you can imagine, uh, data is often messy in the real world, unlike academic data sets. Uh, and since most of these incoming data are in the form of text, these are some of the common challenges which I'm pretty sure all of you have come across in your own problems, right? Multiple formats, missing data, incomplete data, just to name a few. And the goal is to go from these challenges and build uh, a database that, ha that is complete, clean, reliable, using which we can build deep learning models. So that is where data science comes into the picture, right? Now we have a problem that we are trying to solve, and uh, we have realized some of the ways we can tackle those problems, and now we want to use data science to see if we can accelerate uh, and find a solution. And that's where product intelligence comes into picture. It's uh, a data science team at SPINS uh, where they mainly are building these deep learning models and they worked with us for this particular project and we helped them build and accelerate uh, this roadmap of, of deriving intelligence. So yeah, before that, what defines a product at SPINS? Uh, so given this image, I'm pretty sure you can already uh, tell what the name of the company is uh, how many pieces of oatmeal square are in this box. Um, uh, so these would be the attributes that you can easily tell from this uh, picture, right? But as I mentioned, SPINS receives data in the form of text, in the form of product descriptions, and we're trying to extract each of these attributes from the textual descriptions. So for this particular example, a description might look something like Nat Valley SFT, which means soft, uh, BKD baked, OTML, oatmeal, squares, something, I don't know what that means, 1.24 ounces and six pack, right? And from this product description, we are trying to extract each of those attributes. So before jumping into the solution, if I were to give this problem to you, how would you go about solving it? Well, you can already see that um, you can probably do some string processing to extract uh, six PK, meaning that it's six packs. You can probably extract 1.24 ounces, where 1.24 ounces for one pack, so 1.24 times six would be 7.44 ounces. So you can really look into the string and come up with your own rules to build this first POC. Um, so, for this particular talk, I'm just gonna focus on the attribute of predicting brand because I think it's one of the coolest and also the most challenging. Um, so to give you an idea, what we wanna do is given product descriptions, we would like to identify or classify the brand that the product description belongs to, right? Um, and the challenges that come with this problem is product descriptions can already contain a brand name. So imagine you already have a database of possible brand names. You could simply iterate over each of the brand names, see if that particular string exists in the description, and then just call it a day, right? 
but then of course it's difficult it's not scalable and it's it's from a time complexity point of view it's very expensive right uh, product descriptions can have a partial brand name for instance as opposed to having uh, i don't know coca cola you could just have co and then space and then c o l a right where the first co is actually coca right so that's the partial brand name you could have brand abbreviations um, i don't i don't know an example so i'm just going to skip that or you could have no indication of any brand at all it could be a very vague description of like chocolate biscuit and the brand could be oreo right so there are a lot of challenges that come with this particular uh, uh, problem to make things even worse uh, spins has 86000 brands in the database so it's not just an image net kind of 1000 way classification problem we are trying to classify these product descriptions into one of 86000 classes and you can see 54% of the data comes from the top 1000 brands so you can imagine the long tail distribution nature of this particular problem so you have a lot of brands that have maybe one maybe two samples and on top of that, the product descriptions for the, the image that we just saw could also come in various forms. So it may be the one that we saw in the previous slide, but it would also take you know, forms of, of the examples that you see over here. The last one is amazing because it's an UPC code. UPC are like unique identifiers of products. And sometimes we get these kind of descriptions and you know, there's no way you can tackle this. It's, it's, it's very difficult, right? Um, but anyways, so first, I know we are at a deep learning summit, but it doesn't hurt to start with rule-based models. Uh, so that's pretty much what we did. Uh, we looked at these descriptions and we looked at the, the brands that we're trying to classify and we see that, can we come up with efficient lookup tables, right? Very much custom handmade rules. And can we come up with a, a model that's good enough, right? So what we did is uh, we, made use of tree data structures, which as you may know, it's basically a nested dictionary that allows constant time lookup. Um, and we did some form of string matching. Fuzzy Wuzzy is a very popular Python package. I don't know if you have worked with it, but we did use that a lot. And finally, we did some thresholding. So once we get the Fuzzy Wuzzy scores, we wanna see what exactly should be the threshold for me to accept this answer versus reject the answer. And this is at a very high level what the tree looked like. Of course, for IP reasons, I cannot tell you what the rules are, but you get the idea. Um, and to our surprise, we managed to get a 77% accuracy. Now, I will say this is an overall accuracy, not balanced. Uh, so 77% accuracy, which is good enough, according to me. Uh, but of course, there are multiple drawbacks, right? Uh, first of all, multiple brands can have the same description. As I said, Chocolate biscuits could mean Oreo, it could mean bourbon, or it could mean something else that I have no idea of. Uh, string matching can create a lot of false positives. Um, choosing the right threshold can be very, very tricky, right? Because there are 86,000 brands. You can't have a threshold for 86,000 brands. It's, very, it's a laborious process. Predictions are not probabilistic, meaning that when I feed my description into this rule-based system, all it's giving me is a label without any indication of how confident the model is that the description belongs to this particular label. And finally, because it's a rule-based model, it's very difficult to scale, it's very difficult to maintain. You can't have people going around looking into you know, these ever you know, uh, expanding data sets and come up with custom rules, right? So we need to automate the process. And that's where the transformer comes into picture. Um, just out of curiosity, how many of you, just by a show of hands, are familiar with Hugging Face or Transformers? Okay, a decent like 50%, uh, which is amazing because then the next slide makes sense. Um, so Transformer models are pretty much the next level or the state of the art in NLP right now. And pretty much anywhere you go, you talk to a person and you're like, what problem are you solving? And then when you ask them the solution, they pretty much tell you, yeah, I'm just using something from Hugging Face, which is this online repository of transformer networks. Transformers have pretty much revolutionized not just NLP, vision, and right now vision language training as well, multimodal reasoning. And for this project, we basically leveraged uh, the BERT transformer network. BERT was a paper that came out of Google. And all improvements that you hear about in research these days are 
technically using this BERT backbone. Um, so it's very reliable. It has stood the test of time, and by that I mean three years in the, in the world of AI. Um, so what we did is we took the BERT model. Uh, it, it, it's, al it's, uh, it's already pre-trained on a huge corpus. So this model already understands syntax, semantics of English language. And because we are dealing with clients that send us descriptions in English, it's a good match. Um, and of course, we went ahead with the conventional 80-10-10 split, where 80% being the training split, 10% the validation, and 10% testing. And of course, the hope was this language model would be more robust to syntactic variations. So these patterns that we are trying to find manually, the model should be able to pick up on these patterns and learn those associations automatically without us having to go in and do everything you know, by hand. And of course, uh, if you are, if you have ever seen uh, Sesame Street, this is Bert. And since the model is named after that, I thought it'd be cool to have his picture. Um, however, we, when we evaluated this model, you can see the 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 accuracy. There was a drop in performance, a 22% drop. And what I think, and what the data suggests, is these models are extremely data hungry, meaning that they need a lot of examples to really learn the patterns, right? But as I said, 50% of the data uh, comes from the first 1,000 brands out of 86,000 brands. So it's long tail. So basically what this model is doing is it's zeroing in on the brands that have a lot of data and is struggling with the ones that have very few samples. Rule-based systems, on the other hand, can deal with class imbalances. Why? Because you can have a brand that has only one sample but if that's a consistent description, the rule-based model will always get that right. Transformers, on the other hand, will struggle, and it is struggling. So what does that mean? We call it a day? Uh, definitely not. Um, the, there are a lot of benefits, right? I think one of the themes in today's entire summit has been the need of automation, right? Accuracy is good enough, but since the goal is to automate the manual process, we still went ahead with the transformer model. Why? Because at the end of the day, transformers are spitting out a probabilistic score between zero and one, suggesting that I'm very confident about this particular prediction versus I'm not confident about this prediction. So you can imagine for the classes that the model has learned really, really well, it is going to give me very high probabilistic scores. So I can easily come up with a threshold, just one threshold, above which all items can be easily automated, and the remaining ones can go through a human-in-the-loop system, right? So that's what we did. We allow high-confidence predictions because, you know, it, it allows us to automate items. Uh, and so the next step is basically put this into production, right? Because we have what we needed, and we did manage to hit the rate of automation for the first version of the POC. And I'll say up front, I was the applied research scientist working on this problem. Uh, the, the next three, four slides was put together by the ML engineer, Kirill, whom you met this morning. So I'll try to do, a, I'll try to do justice to the slides that he put together, but please bear with me if, if you think I'm seeing something wrong. So this is the overall uh, pipeline that we built for Spins, our, our customer. And first, diving into model training at a very high level. We want to, again, not just automate predictions, but we want to automate the pipeline, right? We want to not have data scientists go in and manually train models every time new data comes in. So we have Airflow pipeline, which is basically uh, a pipeline that allows you to automate training models as well. So every month, whenever new data comes into Spins' system, a trigger uh, happens, and then a model is automatically trained without a data scientist having to go in, manually scour through data, create CSV files and then training models. All of it is taken care of automatically by Airflow. Of course, we have a model assessment layer. The responsibility of this layer is to ensure that the, mo the new model that has been trained is better than the model that we saw last month or in the previous N months, right? Because if the new model is no better than you know the model that was trained last month, then why do we even bother moving it into production, right? Um, then we have a model serving layer, which, uh, again, as Kirill had mentioned in the morning, it's a combination of something with Docker and Kubernetes. 
Uh, and finally, we expose the model predictions via a REST API, right? Because at the end, if your model is not being adopted and used by your end users, then what is the point? Um, so users, which is the product intelligence team, they send product descriptions to the REST API. That triggers the, the production uh, pipeline. You get the predictions, and then it's displayed on the monitor screen, as you can see, uh, with two people whom I think represent members of the PI team. So what's the impact, right? We spoke about research, we spoke about production, but what's the business value that we're driving out of this project, right? First of all, um, we were able to automate 30% of the samples that comes into SPINS's pipeline every month, and the total number of samples that comes in is around 100 million samples. So 30% of that is 30 million samples that were supposed to be manually, you know, uh, identified by humans, now all of it happens via a, a system. So we have automated 30% of items that comes in every month into SPINS' system. This, of course, has reduced the amount of time and associated costs that would have been spent otherwise on human annotators, right? And I'm talking mechanical Turks, I'm talking, uh, you know, uh, annotators within SPINS. Uh, of course, this allows easier customer retention and earlier revenue recognition. What that means is, as SPINS is expanding into more and more retailers, they can very easily onboard these customers by very quickly running their data through these systems, getting all the predictions, and then doing some sort of you know, further analysis and sharing that feedback with the retailers, driving those insights and sharing them with retailers, because at the end, that's what matters. And finally, differentiation and brand elevation. Right now, Spins, as I said, is a leader in the retail industry. And to our knowledge, there are not a lot of companies in this industry that are leveraging deep learning models to solve these problems. So I did a very quick run through of this entire collaboration. But in case you want to learn more about the specifics and see how these insights can help your own projects, please feel free to take a look at this blog post. It's, it's not as condensed as this talk. Um, and I hope that you learn a lot more about this problem and the work that we do at Georgian. And thank you. At Georgian, we run this monthly paper club community where engineers, data scientists, researchers, what you may have, like everybody jumps on a call where we discuss the most recent trends uh, so that you are always up to date and you're not falling behind. Uh, and both Spins and Georgian are hiring, so take a look at this page. If anything sparks interest, send me a line and we'll see what we can do. A quick shout out to you know, everyone who was involved in this, in this project. Um, so yeah, that's it, that's the talk. Thank you so much once again.